morning, men. Hey, I uh, just got to share this. Across the street from the office is a cigar store, and they have one of those white signs where you can put the black stick-on letters, you know, and uh, the sign says, uh, AIG bonus checks cashed here. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay, so here's the deal. We're, we're doing a series called Hanging Out with Jesus. It's for the rest of, the, it's, it's for the rest of my life. And uh, because we're doing the Gospels. It's story, stories about Jesus from the Gospels. And uh, we're going to take little breaks, uh, you know, each year. But, but that's the series that we're in. And so we're basically going through uh, the harmony of the Gospels uh, verse by verse. And uh, a harmony of the Gospels is an attempt to take the four Gospels and put them in chronological order. So you could do it lots of ways, but we're going through the, through the Jesus stories chronologically. And so we're at Matthew chapter mm, 12. And uh, the last time we were together, we talked about the unforgivable sin. And uh, so I want you to be at Matthew chapter 12, verse 38. But then I also want you to put your finger this morning in Mark chapter 3, verse 20. Mark chapter 3, verse 20. So if you could do that, that'd be great. So he was the president of the New York Knicks, Madison Square Garden, and Radio City City Music Hall. His name is David Checkets. And so David Checkets was having a, one of the worst days of his life. He was in his boss's office, and his boss was, was chewing him out up one side and down the other. And a phone call came. His assistant came in and said, your son, your 15-year-old son, is on the phone. So he said to his boss, I need to take this. His boss is screaming at him. He says, I need to take this. So he went and he spoke to his 15-year-old son and he said, Dad, we have a problem. And he told him how their dog, Winston, had died. And the three younger siblings were still at school and mom was out of town. And so, Dad, what do I do? And he said, son, I'll be home in a few minutes. So he went back into his boss and he said, I've got to go. He said, what? You're not going anywhere. If you leave right now, you are never coming back. He said, well, I'm sorry, but I've got to go. And so he went home. And he was there when the three younger children arrived. And he was able to explain what had happened and to console them. And as a family, they decided what they wanted to do. And so they each got a shovel and they picked a place in the backyard where they would bury Winston, the family dog. And they dug a grave. It was 9 p.m. by the time they finally finished. And then by prearrangement, they took a blanket from one of the boys' beds and wrapped Winston up and buried him in the backyard. And David Checkets said, that was one of the best days of my life. So he had gone from what was one of the worst days of his life to what he later would say was one of the best days of his life. His boss was true to form, and David Checkets did lose his job over that. But David Checkets understood what it takes to be part of a family what it takes to be in a family. And that's what I want us to talk about this morning, the, the topic for the day, what it means to be part of the family. And uh, we're going to start today at, uh, in this Mark passage, Mark 3.20. And I want you to see something in the two verses, 20 and 21. Then Jesus entered a house, and again a crowd gathered, so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. 
can you, you know, you've been this busy before, probably not lately, right? But you've been this busy before where, where you're so busy, you don't even have time to eat. And then in verse 21, it says, when his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him for they said he's out of his mind. So uh, Jesus natural family thought Jesus had gone over the edge, flipped out, gone crazy, thought he was a nut, thought he was a lunatic. Thought he, thought he was deranged. Thought he needed to be in a white jacket. Thought he needed to be committed to some kind of a, a mental hospital, if, if they would have had them. And then, what happens after that, in the Mark passage and also the, 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 uh, the Matthew passage, and you can turn, uh, now you can turn back to Matthew if you want to. What's happening is this interaction that Jesus has with Pharisees who accuse him of doing the, the good deeds that he's doing by the power of uh, Satan, Beelzebub. And so uh, Jesus explains what the unforgivable sin is. And by the way, uh, are there any men who are still nervous about whether or not you've committed the unforgivable sin? Uh, just remember, God is not setting a trap. God is not trying to trick people into the abyss. Quite the opposite. The main thing that is always happening in the world is that God is sovereignly orchestrating all human events to bring us in the right relationship with him and right relationship with each other. So he's not trying to trick people into the abyss. So if uh, the only people that go into the abyss are the ones that fail to repent and put their faith in Jesus. If you repent of your sins and put your faith in Jesus, that's the, that's the only thing that keeps people out. And so the unforgivable sin is, in, the, in essence, it's a failure to repent and put your faith in Jesus. And so if you've done that, relax. Okay. And so he does that, and then he does one more thing here in verse 38 of Matthew 13. Some of those Pharisees, not all of them, but some of the Pharisees that had accused him, some of them uh, actually gave credence to what he said. But, but then they, they came and they said, some of the Pharisees and teachers of the law said to him, Teacher, we want to see a miraculous sign. We want to see a sign from heaven. We've seen these, these things that, 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 that are being done, these healings. Well, you know, Jesus was not the only one that could do supernatural things. There were, there were sorcery and things like that at that time, too. And so they wanted to see something, a miraculous sign from heaven. But here's what Jesus said in verse 39. A wicked and adulterous generation asks for a miraculous sign. Notice that he calls them wicked and adulterous. This is, this is spiritual adultery. You know, whenever you, whenever you make an idol, whenever you make an idol or you worship another god, you are committing spiritual adultery against God. We belong to the family of God, uh, and we, we have a, a relationship with God, and to have a relationship with somebody else, that's a two-time him. A lot of two-time in guys, right? So, that's what he's talking about here when he mentions the word adultery. But none will be given, no sign will be given, except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Now, I read this and I say, oops, three days and three nights. Hmm, let's see. Jesus was crucified on Friday. This is a little sidebar. Uh, Jesus was crucified on Friday. So Friday night he was in the ground. And then Saturday. And then Saturday night he was in the ground. And then he was risen from, uh, raised from the dead on Sunday. That's two nights, not three. It says here. It says... Uh, Jesus says, uh, three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So, what's going on? Well, it's the Jewish way of speaking. We have a way of speaking today where we, where we say, well, okay, we say things like, uh, okay, I'll be just a minute. But we don't really mean just a minute, right? Or we say, well, dinner's at 8. But what we really mean is, you better not show up before 8.15. Or if you're Cuban, you better not show up before you're 10, before 10. You know? So we say things, we have customs, we have language customs. And it was the language custom of the day to include uh, any part of the day uh, in a reference as part, uh, uh, as, a, as a full day. So if, 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 if in the Jewish custom, if somebody was going to say, well, uh, let's, let's get together from uh, 12, <clears throat> 12 in the afternoon to 5, 5 uh, p.m., 
I'm making this up as I go. That's not a very good illustration. But anyway, from 12 to 5 p.m., uh, then they would, they would just basically count that as a whole day in the, in the Jewish. So that's just a Jewish custom. We have language customs today, and they had language customs then. That's all there is to that. There's, there's nothing more to that. You know, some people, Bible critics, who say, oh, well, this proves, you know, blah, blah, blah. Blah, 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 blah. 41. The men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And now, one greater than Jonah is here. And then the queen of Sheba, the south, she will rise at the judgment <coughs> with this generation and condemn it, for she came from the ends of the earth to listen to Solomon's wisdom, and now one greater than Solomon is here. So what does Jesus say? He said, hey, look. <clears throat> the heathens, the heathens believed at the preaching of one good preacher. But you, the Israelites, I'm the son of God and you don't repent. What's up? The heathen, Queen of Sheba, came from a long, long way away to inquire of the wisdom of one far less than the one who's speaking to you, the son of man. But why didn't you... Listen to the wisdom of the Son of Man. Verse 43. When an evil spirit comes out of a man, it goes through arid places seeking rest and does not find it. Then it says, I will return to the house I left. When it, when it arrives, it, it finds the house unoccupied, swept clean and put in order. Then it goes and takes with it seven others more wicked than itself. They go in, live there, final condition, worse than the first. That's how it's going to be with this wicked generation. And this is, then he concludes this, this conversation <clears throat> that he's having with, the, uh, with these, the, the, these Pharisees. And, um, yeah, we could say more about that. You know, and if I had two lifetimes to go through the Gospels, I'd do that. But I want to focus on this next passage with you. And uh, the first thing... Uh, First thing we're going to talk about here is, uh, you know, we're going to talk about what it means to be part of the family. We're going to talk about uh, the first point is to be part of Christ's family is to be his disciple. The first point today is that to be part of Christ's family is to be his disciple. Let's start at verse 46. All right. Now, you remember that Jesus family, they're coming to get him, right? They're coming to, to take charge of him because they think he's a nut, right? All right? And so then this, this conversation that we just had, that Jesus was having, is over. And it says in verse 46, While Jesus was still talking to the crowd, his mother and brothers stood outside wanting to speak to him. Someone told him, your mother and brothers are standing outside wanting to speak to you. He had four brothers. Matthew chapter 15, verse 54, something like that. He had four brothers and, a, and uh, at least three sisters. <clears throat> Verse 48. He replied, Who is my mother and who are my brothers? And then he pointed to his disciples. And he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother or, and sister and mother. So, Jesus is saying that it's not my temporal family that I'm trying to, to, to build here. It's, it's an eternal family. It's a, it's a much bigger family than that. And, uh, and he pointed to his disciples and he said, you're my family. If you do the will of God, you're my family. You're my mother. You're my brother. You're my sister. You're my... And so the first point is to be part of Christ's family is to be a disciple. He says it right there. He's pointing at the disciples. He says, okay, disciples, if you do the will of God, then you're part of my family. So, you know, what is a disciple? I talk about that a lot around here. And uh, I would would love to believe that you remembered everything I've ever taught you about what it means to be a disciple. And I'm sure most of you do, but for that one or two of you may not remember exactly what I said about it. Let me just re remind you. First of all, the biblical description... That's just being sarcastic, sorry. 
the, 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 uh, the biblical definition of a disciple is, is there's a Greek word, uh, mathetes, and, and it means a, a pupil or a learner. Uh, but when used in conjunction with Jesus, a disciple came to mean an adherent to the person and teachings of Jesus. Now, there is an actionable definition in the, in the Bible that is so fantastic. And I, I, and I love it because it is actionable, because you can, you can build your life around this definition. And, and that is, is that a disciple is three things. Anybody want to re- remind me what they are? A disciple is called and equipped and sent. Called, equipped, and sent. Calling, equipping, and sending. First, a disciple is someone called to live in Christ. That's the evangelism piece. Secondly, a disciple is someone equipped to live uh, like Christ. And that would be the teaching piece. That would be the teaching them everything I've commanded you piece. And then the third is that they are sent to live for Christ. That would be to love uh, to love other people. That's neighbor love. Um, all men will know you're my disciples if you love one another. And it means to, to hold to his teachings. If you hold to my teachings, you will know the truth and you are really my di- what disciples. And you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. And then, and then to be, uh, do good deeds, to, to bear fruit. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my what? Disciples. And so, calling, equipping, sending. In fact, you should know, it's kind of interesting at least, that every week when I prepare the message here, I have a a worksheet. I've mentioned this before. And on the worksheet, I have what percentage of this message is devoted to call men to Christ, what percentage of this message is devoted to equip men in Christ, and what percentage of this message is, is, is meant to send men to live for Christ. And then... If, if, if I'm planning to say something to you that doesn't either call, equip, or send you, then, then I cut it out. You know why? Because I'm out just taking a walk. I, I, I might as well be on Fox News Radio, right? I, I'm, just giving, I'm just giving my own airy opinions. If, unless I'm doing something that either calls men to, to live in Christ, equips men to live like Christ, or sends men to live for Christ. And that's what a disciple is. A disciple is someone called, equipped, and sent. Now, the problem here with, with his family, what was the problem they had? They didn't believe him. It says in John chapter 7, verse 5, that a little bit later on in the, in the gospel stories, that his brothers did not believe in him. They didn't, they didn't believe him. And so, that's, they had not responded to the calling part yet. They had not responded to the being in Christ part yet. Now, later, as it turns out, they will. They will. And what's the problem that the, the, the Pharisees had? Uh, why weren't they part of the family? Why weren't they disciples? They, they were so rigid in their worldview that, that they, they're, they were such hard nuts that not even the, 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 the gospel presented by the gospel was enough to, to crack through their hard heads. And so, and so what's the problem today? Same problems. <laughs> People feel like they know so much about Jesus, but they don't believe in Him. They think they're part of His family, but they're not because they don't believe Him. And... And others are so rigid in the way that they, they think about things. They're so hard-headed that, that the gospel can't, can't break through. All right. And so, how do you become a disciple? The big idea today. How do you become part of the family? To be part of Christ's family is to be a disciple doing the will of God. That's what it means to be part of Christ's family. So what is the main thing that's happening? Jesus is, is always sovereignly orchestrating human events to bring us into right relationship with him and right relationship with each other. In other words, Jesus is trying to run an orderly family. 
And to be part of that family is to be a disciple doing the will of God. And the disciple part of that is that you're called to live in Christ, equipped to live like Christ, and sent to live for Christ. All right. So, that's the big idea. To be part of Christ's family is to be a disciple doing the will of God. So, if the first point is to be part of Christ's family is to be a disciple, the second point is to be part of Christ's family is to do the will of God. It's to do the will of God. Well, what is the will of God? Well, what is the will of God? Well, there's so many ways to talk about that. I guess we could be here for a long, long time, right? Uh, this is the will of God. So, if you want to know what the will of God is, uh, one way to, to get at that is to, to get in this. And that's why we're here for a Bible study every week. I mean, I'm pretty impressed that you, you guys... Look, there are two million people that live in metropolitan Orlando, and how many are willing to get up at oh dark 30 every Friday morning and come out and be with a bunch of guys and study the Bible? I mean, it's pretty impressive. I mean, this is pretty amazing what's going on here. I, every Friday morning for 23 years, this is fantastic. So this is it. What This is the will of God. This is, this is ac, uh, uh, the acquisition. The, you are acquiring the, the, you know, the, the will of God. A little bit more specifically, it could be uh, described as what uh, the Ten Commandments and the Golden Rule. That would be another way of describing uh, the will of God. Uh, we could say Jesus said, go and make disciples. So we could say that becoming a disciple, that's the will of God. And the Bible gives four universal purposes that apply to every human being. Uh, number one is to love God. That's the, the great commandment. Number two is to love one another. Neighbor love. That's the second commandment. And then there is the great commission to go and make disciples, to, to go call, equip, and send people. And then, there's, and then there's the cultural mandate. That's the fourth universal purpose, the cultural mandate, to go and, and to, uh, to attend the culture. And that's where we get... Uh, our, that's where marriage comes in and raising families and doing work and uh, making contributions to education and the arts. And uh, that's where the military is, the education system, blah, blah, blah. So, the, so all of these things are, are, are the will of God. And to be part of Christ's family is to be obedient to do. When we say to do, the word to do there should be... Uh, considered the word obedience. To be part of Christ's family is to obey the will of God. It's about obedience. So, to be part of Christ's family is to be a disciple, is to be called and equipped and sent in Christ. And, but, but then also, uh, to, to obey God. To obey the will of God. To do the will of God. Uh, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, and I'll say, you know, away from me, I didn't, do, I, 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 I didn't know you. Only those who do the will of my Father. So this will thing is, you know, like really important. So what does that look like in practice? Well, um, you know, maybe, maybe you are able to uh, lead a Bible. So I think probably half of the, the men in here lead their own groups in their churches and business groups and things like that. All, a lot of you are already leading your own groups. And, and so you, you're obeying the will of God by, by making other disciples in that way. Uh, I, I was with a man this week. He doesn't have the, uh, the ability to do that, but he has the ability to convene men. And so he convened a, a number of men this week uh, and, and then, then, allowed me to, to, then allowed me to speak to them. Uh, so he could convene. He didn't have... The, the right gifting necessarily to, to be the speaker, but he had me do it for him. So, um, uh, some, some people are not speaking, but they are really, really good at serving. So, for example, uh, Cyber, where's Cyber? Oh, there he is. So, so, so Jim, yeah, he's, he's, so Jim uh, it works with hospice, and he goes and he, and he sits with people who are dying, and he comforts them, and he encourages them, and he actually also he, he's learned how to present the gospel to them as well, which is very interesting. Uh, so even though he doesn't doesn't think of himself as having a speaking gift, he actually does. So he's having a big impact. He's doing the will of God. He he he's getting 
he's getting a nudge. He's getting a nudge from somewhere. Where could that be? He's getting a nudge, and he's acting on it. He's doing the will of God. All right? So let's just take a little bit of a look at uh, this final piece today. Oh, yeah, yeah, the big idea. Yeah, so to be part of Christ's family is to be a disciple doing the will of God, obeying the will of God. Um, obedience, you know, it's, it's just not politically correct word, so I didn't put it up there. But, you, you know, you can read between the lines. Okay, so, <laughs> you know, how can I best contribute to my family? I got to tell you this story. I was uh, surfing around on, on, our, on our own website, Man of the Mirror's website, and I uh, stumbled across the, the page that has the, the bios. It has my bio and David Delk, Delk's bio and uh, Brett Clemmer's bio. <clears throat> And I noticed that, uh, I, and I had just updated my bio, that's why I was uh, looking there, and I wanted to make sure it was, you know, uh, correct. And so I looked at uh, David's bio, and I looked at Brett's bio, and I realized that, A, they were not that up to date. And then, number two, it occurred, it occurred to me, so many of the, the, uh, the accomplishments of the ministry really were attributable to, to their leadership and efforts, too. And so I, I thought it would be a good idea for them to pull more of the, the man-in-the-mirror statistics and what man-in-the-mirror has accomplished, to pull some of that into their resume, not to take credit for it, but to, to associate themselves with it, because that would be fair, right? So we, we were at a meeting, and I brought this up, and I, and I mentioned what I had been doing. And, and, and what I said to them was I said, so, uh, David and Brett, uh, I really think you need to update your resumes. <laughs> of course, what I meant to say was, I really think you need to update your bios, but man, by then all the blood was out of both their faces. And so it was, it was pretty funny. So I was just trying to contribute to the family, you know, and sometimes it works out, sometimes it doesn't. So, so what, is the, what is the best way you can contribute to your family? Well, number one is to make sure you're going about the, the, everything you, you, you uh, should be doing to, to be uh, a disciple and to be a good one. To, 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 you know, you've been called, so that piece is done. But the equipping, you're doing that here and other ways, and that's great. And then also the sending, the, 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 the loving, the holding to the teaching, and then the serving, those three pieces you know, sent to live for Christ. And, uh, and then just, the, just this doing the will of God thing, there's, there are two ways to talk about it. Uh, one is in general and the other is in particular. So just in general to do the will of God means that um, you are going to participate as an agent, as an ambassador for God in his efforts to sovereignly orchestrate all human events to bring people into right relationship with him and right relationship with each other. That's the main thing. That's the main thing that God, God is wanting to accomplish. He's building this family, bringing people in the right relationship with each other and, and with him. And so if that's the main thing and you want to be, be part of the deal, you want, want to be part of the family, you want to be a disciple, you want to do the will of God, then this is what, this is what you, you do in a general way. And so you, you kind of like, you just, you just kind of like a walking around, you're like this love muscle. You're like walking around, you know, like a, uh, we used to have this yellow Labrador retriever. We, her name was Katie, and she was like a, a size 10 dog in a size 3 house. You know, she, she just wagged, you know, every time she sees somebody, every time she, she wagged, she knocked chairs over, you know. Things. She's just like a big love muscle. And, and, that, and that's, what, that's what it means to be part, I think that's a pretty good way of what it means to represent Christ in the world. It's to be this big Happy, love muscle, Labrador retriever kind of, you know, making a mess. But, but there's no question that you are in love with everybody that you meet. That's part of what it means to be doing the will of God. That's part of what it means to be a disciple. It means to, in, in general, it means to be participating in the main thing. You're just like this love muscle. Loving people. 
And then in particular, uh, it means that you, you know what your gifting is. Everybody has spiritual gifts. Some of you can stand up here and do what I'm doing. Uh, some of you cannot. Uh, some of you can go sit with a hospice person, and, and some of you, like me, cannot. Uh, my wife, Patsy, and I, our gifting is so very, very different. She goes down and rubs the feet of this, this 90-year-old woman who's dying of kidney cancer. Uh, you know, and, 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 and I could no more do that. I mean, I mean, if you paid me enough money, I probably could do it. But, I mean, it's just, it is just, I mean, it's like, it makes me, it, 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 I mean, I would, well, there were, I mean, I would rather, I would rather work for Portal at cleaning uh, portable comfort houses than, than do something. I know that's probably not true, but anyway, I, I just, it just doesn't, I can't get my mind around. So just because you can't do everything, though, it doesn't mean you can't do anything. And, and the way you do something in, in particular, is you, you need to know what your gifting is. And so if you don't know what your gifting is, uh, uh, talk about it with your table leader. Talk about it with your pastor. Um, and if you do know what your gifting is, then you're in great shape. And then, and then the second thing you can do in particular is you can just you can be aware of the nudge. You know, I, I look for the nudge all the time. I'm, I'm, I'm asking God all the time to speak to me. To, to give me the nudge um, for, for talking to you guys this morning. But, but everything, you know, do you want me to call this person? Um, and then sometimes, you know, people want me to do things and I get a nudge against it. You've had that happen, yes? I mean, everybody's had that happen, right? You, somebody really wants you to do something, but you get a nudge against it. And uh, you're thinking, wow, this is really going to hurt that person's feelings. But the, the, the thing is, is that you want to be doing the will of God. Because that's what it means to be part of Christ's fa- family. So, so Jim Angelakos, our Bible study administrator, he gets a nudge. Okay? He's on Facebook. And he and his son uh, decide that they would like to simply ask a question uh, that would help uh, uh, to, uh, for anybody on Facebook who's a, in the, who's a pro-lifer to identify themselves. So on Valentine's Day, February 14, uh, Jim posts a question on Facebook, basically asking, you know, if, if, uh, if you are uh, a pro-lifer, if you're pro-life, uh, would you raise your hand and identify yourself? And so, uh, I'm making these numbers up, I guess, but after about a week, well, Jim, after a week, you had uh, six people had raised their hands in a week. Is that right? Like I said, 122 <laughs> after just one week. Wow. All right. And then after two weeks, how many people had raised their hands? 1,300 people. And then after three weeks? 7,000. And after four weeks? 17,000. And then after the fifth week? 25,000. And then the next week? 400,000. And then last Saturday, uh, over 900, no, and then today there are over a million people. So Jim Angelakos responded to a nudge from the Holy Spirit, and now every pro-life organization in the world is wanting to get on his A-list. Jim Angelakos, since in, in the few weeks since Valentine's Day, has become arguably the most influential pe- person in the pro-life movement. Because he because he understands the big idea that to be part of Christ's family is to be a disciple doing the will of God. To listen to the nudge. Let's pray. Our dearest Father, Lord, we come humbly to you, our great God. We, we, uh, we, we worship you in the beauty of your holiness in the perfections of your creation, and in the intricacies of human life, where you are calling people in a right relationship with you and and each other. And uh, you're building this family. And that we're your mother and your sister and your brother when we are disciples who do the will of God. Lord, help us just 
this is a reminder this morning, but Lord, help us. Help us to obey the will of God. Help us to be after our own discipleship in general and in particular. And help us to each also listen to the nudges that you give us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.